Asalaamu Alaikum everyone. Today I have with me none other than Tanim Zaman, the man who I would describe as living a fascinating life, very, very off the beaten track, rags to riches story, going from starting from zero pounds to creating a business that's alhamdulillah still growing and over a, hundred, a million and a half per year at the moment. And Tanim has gone through all sorts of challenges and overcome them both, you know, personal, but also business perspectives as well. And so we're going to dig into all of that today with Tanim. Tanim, it's an absolute pleasure to have you here. Thank you so much for having me. I mean, I follow the podcast and to be in it is surreal. <laughs> Let's do it. I shall. So Tanim, we, we sat in one of your wonderful homes, uh, Sequoia Homes. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I'm assuming you must have started with a lot of money to get to where you are. Um, so, yeah, like you said, this is one of the properties that we manage. Um, I think this is property number 36. And when I started, I actually had zero money. Wow. Zero money. So how does that work? How does that work? And then well, where are you today? So it's from zero money to today, where are you today? Today we're collecting about 125,000-ish pounds a month in rent. Wow. Alhamdulillah, that's basically 160, 162 tenants, individual tenants. Wow. So it's a 1.5 million a year type of recurring revenue, which wow. is what I was after. Some type of recurring income yeah. that I can depend on for a long time. Incredible, incredible. And um, we're going to go through Tanim. Like, we've known each other for a long time. Long time, for sure. Um, and I've seen your journey from you know, university, mm -hmm. uh, all the way through the, I would say the hard years yeah. in the middle. And, and then, you know, it feels like it's been a real inflection point over the last couple of years or the last yeah. year or so. Uh, Alhamdulillah, it feels like, you know, things are going really well. Mm -hmm. And um, I think you're the classic, you know, rags to riches story. Well, I, I don't know, uh, we'll, we'll find out. <laughs> Definitely uh, rags. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to like heading into the riches inshallah, inshallah. and <clears throat> and i think you've done that in that entire period with a very like strong kind of ethos or emphasis on you know islam and spirituality mm -hmm. and, like you, you've got like some very clear views about mm -hmm. things and your principles and like you know I, you don't want to deviate away from that mm -hmm. which i think is uh, brilliant right to see um so we're going to go through all of that inshallah. as well um but i wanted to first start with um, you know, your background, like where are you, where are you from, where were you born? So I am a Bangladeshi guy who was born in Italy. Oh really? Yeah, I was born in Italy. Still have an Italian passport. Oh really? Can you speak uh, Italian? Yeah, perfettamente. Oh really? <laughs> yes. Oh wow. It's not as good as it used to be. Yeah. Um, but we came to the UK when I was about 12 years old. Right. My mom's side of the family has a, uh, sorry, my mom has a lot of family in the UK. They were like, what are you guys doing in Italy? Come over here, better education, English language, better opportunities. So yeah, came over, was depressed for two years because life was really good in Italy. Really? And an amazing childhood, amazing childhood. Olive oil, olives, figs. Uh, kind of, it's more like um, the community vibe. Everybody knows everyone, you run out of anything, you knock next door. Oh really? Um, yeah, you don't need babysitters. The neighbors just take you in and... So when you say, you know, the local, you mean actual Italians, not just like you were living with other Bengali Oh, no, 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 no. I, we were the only Bangladeshi, well, the only ethnic family in the entire neighborhood. Right. Yeah, okay. and we were treated very well. Like, I was almost royalty in my school. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. How come? Everyone's super nice. I don't know, maybe because we were different. I don't know. Uh, exotic. Exotic, yeah. maybe, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, and when I came here, it was very different. Weather's cold, food's not so great. There's a lot of other Bangladeshis around. You weren't, um, you weren't exo exotic e anymore. Yeah, not exotic anymore. Uh, plenty. There's a lot of uh, diversity in school, in 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 you know, in the society, in schools. Um, I was I used to struggle in school because I need I need a map of the school and my timetable to know where I need to be at what lesson. Whereas in Italy, you don't have any of that. The schools are much smaller. You're in the same class. The teachers come and go. So it was a massive adjustment period. And where were you in in London? Was it? You came to London? Yeah, yeah. Um, straight, we came straight to South London, where right. my, I've got my uncle that lives there, my mom's brother. Right. So we lived there, six of us in a two-bed flat for quite some time until we eventually uh, sold everything in Italy and then uh, moved to Ilford. 
Ah, okay. Because we have relatives here and they said the schools are better and there's more halal food than South London come here. Brilliant. And been here ever since. Ah, okay. So you're neighbours. We're neighbours. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, fantastic, fantastic. So I went to Seven Kings High School. Ah, okay, yeah. okay. So um, uh, how did you find schooling generally, Tanim? Do you think that that was a good experience that you had in schooling? And, and are, you, are there things that you feel like you could have improved mm. uh, that we, we as a community can improve or like our attitude to schooling? So I was the very studious, very nerdy, very geeky, very hardworking student throughout yeah. Alhamdulillah, it did pay off in terms of grades, but I came out of sixth form and university with very little soft skills. Mm. So I actually, um, before university, because I didn't want to take any loans for university, I applied as deferred entry. Mm. So I did, I took a year out, a gap year. I didn't go traveling, I was trying to work. And um, my intention was, I'll do anything, deliver pizzas, work in Sainsbury's, mm. whatever, for let a year. Me, let me stop you there. What, does you, what do your parents do? What are your parents' backgrounds? My parents are both healthcare workers, right, minimum wage healthcare workers, which actually has been my driving force, is mm. how can I get them to stop working as soon as possible? And that means I need to earn a lot of money very quickly. Mm. That means I have to do very well at school. I have to get to maybe Oxford, Cambridge, LSE. I have to get to the city probably banking, because I don't like reading stuff, so law wasn't an option, yeah. being a pilot wasn't an option, being a yeah. doctor wasn't an option for me, I wasn't very good at chemistry. So banking sounds great. So that was the goal, in year 10 I made that goal, and I researched everything that wow. I need to go to, either to, I need to do economics at either Cambridge, Oxford or LSE. Oh my God, in year 10? In year 10, I, that was the goal. It's crazy. And I picked the A-levels based on what these universities like to see. So I did five A-levels. And I got, alhamdulillah, I got A's in all of them. And got to LSE. I got, uh, got, got called for, uh, at Oxford for an interview, but I completely flopped it. Oh, Why? No. I, had no, I had no speaking skills. I just right. completely froze. I just didn't know how to hold a conversation. I didn't know how to behave in yeah. an interview situation. I was yeah. just good at the, paper, uh, at the academic stuff. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I think that's a major failing of um, the education system. Unfortunately, maybe, and I went to very good schools, mm. top rated schools. They're not grammar schools, but we're top rated. Yeah. Um, but what I did realize is my true education only started after I finished university. That's when my true education really started. After university, this is like a fascinating period for me because mm. you took a right turn here. Yeah. That most people, there's a straight path. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and really that's the path I wanted. I was working so hard to get onto that path for a yeah. while, right? And you were kind of on that path already, right? You, yeah. You'd got the internships, you'd done the, I think you possibly yeah, yeah. had a job lined up as well or something. Uh, kind of. So it's an interesting one because I worked for a year at age 17 in Deloitte. That was a blessing that came out of saying no to Riba, right. which is another message that I have, which when you say no, to something haram for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you'll be amazed what doors open up. That was probably one of the best decisions I've ever made because I probably wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for that. So at 17, I'm in a corporate world, dream come true. And then I start seeing things that are quite disturbing me. I'm sat in this office 10 hours a day doing boring work. Um, I'm supposed to work the ladder to get to director level one day. That guy's miserable. <laughs> He's working 100 hours a week, doesn't see his children. Yeah. My senior manager would talk to his children at lunchtime for five minutes. I would only see them in the weekends because when he leaves their home in the morning, they're asleep. When he comes home in the evening, they're asleep. So I was like, okay, I wanted the income, but I didn't want this type of lifestyle. So then at age 17, I started thinking, do I really want this life? Didn't know what else was out there. So I thought maybe I tried, maybe it's just the job. That's making me miserable. Mm. So then I tried banking. I tried HR. I tried uh, working in a tech company, Bloomberg. And it was all the same. It was all the same. So then I received amazing advice in my final year that when you graduate, this is not the time to get a start your career. I was mm. like, what? This is you entering a golden window of opportunity that you will never get ever again. Mm. One to three years, you have minimal responsibilities. You can take as much risk as you want. 
you can survive on a few quid a month, this is your time to experiment, explore, chase your dream. You won't be able to do this later. Or you can, but it'll be much, much harder. Yeah. And I was like, you know what, that sounds, that sounds like decent advice. Because <laughs> I was seeing all of my friends who were super active. I saw this, that. They get a good job and then disappear forever. Yeah. There's very few people like yourself who maintained a level of activism or contribution despite having a very demanding career. Mm. Very few people can manage to do that. Um, so I was like, I don't want to fall in that trap. I don't want to be just another statistic like that. So then I had to find an alternative. And fortunately, we live in times where you go on Instagram and you start seeing a 15 year old making two million a month. <laughs> it's like, well, am I missing? I'm missing, I know, I'm in the wrong game. Yeah. And that's sort of where the whole entrepreneurship thing started. Like, okay, this is probably the path that I should go under. And I just became super obsessed with business, entrepreneurship, listening to podcasts, interviews, reading. I was reading two, three books a week wow. on business, this, that. Watching IFG? Uh, IFG wasn't about in those days. It was just a blog, which yeah. I did read. Which, uh, I mean, we're talking 2007, 2009. It, it was a didn't, blog. It didn't even exist then. Exist, yeah, yeah. it wasn't. Um, of course, I watch every episode now, every video, everything, of course, <laughs> alhamdulillah. Um, and yeah, so that's kind of where it all started. So I, what I did, I graduated and I said, okay, I'm going to take another gap here. And how did your, um, you know, your, I, by the way, I completely agree with you. I think that one to three year period is where, you know, you can do so much damage <laughs> yeah. in a good way. Um, yeah. but, and, but I feel like um, it should be quite structured. Like yeah. if you can, you know, figure out, okay, like what is my end goal here? Yeah. And what are the, like the five or six swings I'm going to take at something take. and like, and then, and then try and like figure out, okay, what do I need to like, so how did you approach that? Did you, do you think you, what was the good things you did about that mm -hmm. period? And what great was the, you know, the things you'd improve? I've never been asked this question. So it's a great question. So my plan was to start some sort of online business. Uh, so I, I I had some level of structure, so I joined the program to learn how to do it. At the time, I was actually working in Barclays on my final summer internship. And I would finish at six, take my laptop, go to the top floor in the Barclays Tower in Canary Wharf. That was my dream since childhood to work there. Go into an empty room and work for three hours on my business. Go through the course, implement do my website, do my funnels, do this, do that. And I did that for 11 weeks. Every single day, I would leave at 9 p.m. Which basically meant by the end of it, I actually had a business up and running. Um, so that was good because I had a vehicle. What wasn't so great is that the vehicle wasn't a good one. <laughs> right. Didn't generate nowhere near enough uh, income for me to be able to sustain myself. It was an amazing experience but there was no income, so I couldn't sustain myself. Um, but I think what I did right is figure out what is your plan, mm. find someone that you can learn from and execute. So had that thing worked out, I would have been fine, but it didn't work out. And so then I, I did another interesting thing, which is, okay, I need income, 600, 700 pounds, just to keep me going. Yeah. And I need more skills to mm. do this entrepreneurship thing. I need more skills. This is a whole new ball game. Mm. So then I'm like, okay, what type of role can I do where I can learn valuable skills, relevant skills, and still make a bit of income to sustain myself yeah. so that I can stay in this game yeah. and not have to go to a corporate by the end of the year. So I took a sales job because that was sales was the thing that kept coming up. Every podcast that I listened to, every book about entrepreneurship, you need to learn how to sell. I was like, okay, cool. How do I do that? Let me find the top sales program in the country or whatever good um, training, ideally commission only because mm. it's harder. Yeah. And I joined a health and nutrition company that was selling um, cooking hardware um, priced three to 9,000 pounds. Wow. Yeah. And alhamdulillah, it was a great product. I sold 27 k's worth in my first month wow because uh, <laughs> i didn't realize that alhamdulillah i have a very good network of people that trust me the product is really good i'm using it myself i believe in it yeah and i just 
followed everything that they taught me, the sales process, all of the psychology behind it. Uh, there are some tricks as well, some yeah. tricks for closing people and overcoming objections. And, like what? Uh, well, at the very beginning, getting them to highlight their pain points at right. the very beginning. Tell me about your pain points and let's dig deep into those. And at the end, when you're telling me, I'll think about it, I'll just remind you of your pain points. This is why we're sitting in the first place. Yeah. Can you really afford not to make this decision right now? Mm. What would that cost to you? Mm. So there's a lot of these interesting <laughs> psychological things, which in the wrong hands can be quite manipulative. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but of course, I've always tried to be, uh, have a high of level of integrity and of honesty. I just wanted to help the person. Yeah, and yeah, if yeah, this yeah. product can help you, I will, I will do my best to present it, but the choice is yours, of course. There's a really good book, uh, we probably read it, uh, Influence by Robert Cialdini. Cialdini, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, very, very I'm reading at the moment, and I'm like, oh wow, this is fascinating. Yeah. Like a, a bunch of that stuff, like you kind of, you know, intuitively know, like do it naturally, but it's very interesting to see all of it, yeah. and also how, you know, how it can be done in a systematic way. Systematic, you almost you bring it out as a tool when you mm. need it. Mm -hmm. yeah, and that's a skill, that's, a, that's an important skill. So, so talk to me more than him. So you're now at the age of, so you've kind of now left university. Yeah. Uh, 22, 23, I imagine. Well, yeah. actually university took me a while. Right. I was there for five years. Right. First time in my life, failed something. I failed my first year, failed uh, my second year. Wow. And that's, looking back, it was the most character building period of my life. To still keep coming back, showing up every day, smiling, knowing I may never graduate, but just keep going, keep going, keep going. It taught me perseverance and resilience, which then was invaluable in the world of business. And what was it? Why were you failing? Because you're not, you're not a dumb guy, right? So what was it? I don't know. Well, firstly, um, in my first year, I went crazy with ISOC stuff. Right, okay. And I've always had this thing of being involved mm -hmm. and doing stuff like yourself. That's where we first met. I remember you did a play for the Oxford, uh, Oxford ISOC, I think it was. Oh, really? You, you came I to the remember. Play? I remember watching a video of it. Oh, right. You had the red cap. Yeah, I don't yeah. know if you remember, but I, for some, some strange reason, despite my bad memory, I still remember that. Wow. I remember the Mulvey design days and all yeah. of that. <laughs> um, what was the question, bro? So uh, it was, why did, why did you fail? Oh, why did you fail? Yeah, I went crazy with the ISOC stuff. I wasn't studying nowhere near enough. And it was hard. It was yeah. genuinely hard. I mean, there's economics, a 30 plus right? economics, yeah. The hardest it's degree tough. there. It's tough, very tough. Um, think, looking back, I would have probably enjoyed something like management a bit more. It would have suited me better. Mm. Um, I did really enjoy economics at A-level. Mm. I did very well in it. That's um, easier. It's easier, of course, but I thought, okay, so I'm just going to be this, more of this, but it yeah. wasn't. It was all functions, graphs, yeah. equations. There was no theory. It was like just mathematics, basically. all mathematics, which yeah. wasn't my strong suit. Also, yeah. every tutorial, every class, I was the dumbest guy in the room because you've yeah. got the smartest kids from Hong Kong, yeah. Singapore, Pakistan, uh, America, uh, even South America, like the smartest yeah, yeah, yeah. students. And I was just a guy who worked hard from yeah. Milford, yeah. who got some A's. Uh, but yeah, I, it, I, was out of, I was out of my depth in LSE. Yeah. But I didn't give up. And you got through it? Got through it, alhamdulillah. It was very emotional the day I graduated. Oh, really? For a long time, I didn't think it was going to happen. And final year, you didn't fail? You just like got through no, it? No, alhamdulillah, just about. Just about made it. Alhamdulillah. And uh, yeah, it was very, very emotional. Uh, finally graduating. But why was this such an important phase? And you didn't switch uh, degree either halfway no. through or anything like that? No. Say so if I'm going to, since I've started it, I could have. Many people do yeah. that. They switch to something slightly easier. Yeah. I don't know why I thought if God gave me an opportunity to do economics at LSE, yeah. very prestigious, I shouldn't back down. Yeah. I should see it through. Yeah. And I, the only thing that kept me going is there must be a reason why I'm failing. God is trying mm. to teach me something or there will be something later. Mm. Like Steve Jobs says, the dots join up looking backward. Yeah. And it's true. Looking back, had I not gone through that two years of perseverance, you know, jumping back up, get punched down, jump back up, I wouldn't have lost it in business. Yeah. No way. Because I think it's like, you know, there's a... Um, 
speaking candidly, I think there'll, there'll probably be like an embarrassment aspect to it, right? And a resilience aspect to it. Um, that is probably also the case if whenever you take the path slightly untrodden, because, it, and especially if you take that path and it doesn't quite work um, and you stick at it, you you know there must be a perception. I don't, I don't know how it like how it felt. Embarrassment but, is the is the right yeah. word. I was yeah. embarrassed. Of, of obviously, failing is one thing, and also being broke after gra- graduating for three years yeah. to be broke and not be able to even buy something for the house. Yeah, going to Sainsbury's shopping with your mother, yeah. and she's still having to pay though yeah. you're an LSE graduate supposed yeah, to be yeah, on yeah. a seventy k salary. It's embarrassing. And, and your friends are like, I don't know, 150k or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was yeah. hard as well. Uh, knowing that there's people who may not be as hardworking or as gifted. Yeah. Um, flying and, you know, buying nice houses, cars, getting <laughs> married. And I'm still here thinking, how am I going to pay my phone bill? Yeah. It was hard. Mm. And I was many times very close to giving up many yeah. times, but I would just psych myself up by listening to motivational stuff. I remember <laughs> on the walk from the station to a home. Every day, something motivational. Yeah, I've got to keep going. I, gotta, mm. I don't know what it was. I just needed to keep going. And I'm glad that I did, alhamdulillah. I'm mm. glad that I did. I think it's what was waiting for me was worth fighting for. Yeah, yeah. A, a life of flexibility and freedom and impact yeah. and contribution. That's what I really, really, really wanted. So I'm like, it's, it may be worth... Um, yeah. But you know what? I actually think that the... Uh, in a weird way, you know, the fact that you were fighting for something, mm. you had that bigger goal. I think mm. that in itself is like a, a life worth living. Subhanallah. Because, you know, you know, now things are a little bit easier, right? Quote, unquote, you've mm. made it, right? But, but, but that's the thing, right? It's yeah. not actually, you haven't really made it. Mm-hmm. It's just that, you know, you, you are further along in this journey. Yeah. You're still fighting for a big thing. Mm-hmm. And or you're fighting for something that is worth fighting for. Yeah. And the person who's earning 150,000 or 100,000 whatever they're not they're not fighting for something well, mm. p- perhaps, right? They're perhaps mm. not there's no burning uh, desire for yeah. something, the fueling them yeah. or driving them. Mm. And for some people it might be the right thing to do for but for sure, for sure, most sure. people they're just doing it because it's a paycheck mm-hmm. and it's a big paycheck and they feel like with their qualifications they can get it. And and if that alone is like the level of meaningfulness, then it's not really, mm. you know, it's not really worth it. And, and I feel like there's, and this is possibly the kind of the creative side of me coming out. I feel like, you know, you should be living a movie script mm-hmm. of your life, right? Mm-hmm. There should be that narrative arc. If you're not struggling, if there isn't that period where you're struggling, then like, what are you what doing? What are you striving for? Yeah, like, what are you striving there's for? There's something's wrong. Something's wrong. Um, so, um, I've I've always like really admired. I've I've always said it to you. you I've always it, yeah. really admired the like you know the the hustle mm-hmm. and like the perseverance uh, and the ability to like stick at things because you know um, I think that's the single biggest determinant mm-hmm. of success. Okay. Um, and most people and and I feel like um, frankly I think I've I've had it easier right than than you did in your entrepreneurial journey. I think. Um, but I think, uh, you know, m- most people would not have stuck through, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think, the level of issues and, you know, challenges that you've had in your journey. Um, I think a thought just came to me, which is what actually kept me going. It was, I was hooked on, well, actually, I supplemented the lack of income with fulfillment. So everything that I did, whether it was working, helping my mentor, teach prophetic leadership to the world or helping my community eat more healthily so then they don't have um, block, blocked arteries in their yeah, yeah, 30s yeah. and 40s. There was always an element of fulfillment, which kind of made up for the lack of income. Mm. It kind of made up for it. And I guess that's the ultimate trade-off. How can you have amazing fulfillment and also have amazing income? And that's the trade-off a lot of people um, have to make. What I realized is you can have both. Mm. You need to figure out a way to have both. And for me, I think the, the way to do both is through business. Mm. And I think IFG is an, a fantastic example of that. You have an impact. You, of course, are earning something. You're mm. earning a living. 
you're able to, I mean, you recently published a video about, yeah. right? Yeah, you that net worth, yeah. alhamdulillah, amazing. That's what we want to see more of. Mm. We want to see more of that. So then if I had seen that when I was going through that struggle, mm. it would have helped me. It would have helped yeah. me, you know what, actually, I can be like that. I'm going to keep going. Mm. Uh, I was looking at non-Muslims who went through that struggle and now yeah, they're yeah. flying the world, homeschooling their children and all of that. We don't have Muslim examples of that. Yeah. So, yeah, I think that's what kept me going. But there was, I was always asking myself, when will I actually make some money? <laughs> when will I actually make some money uh, and be comfortable? Because for me, back on my mind is I need to retire my parents. I need yeah. to do, and I knew I can't do that if I'm on a 150k salary. Yeah. yeah. It's, it, it, it's not going to happen. So, Tanim, um, we're going to go into what you sure. do now. Um, but before we do, what are the key ingredients for someone who's now setting up or looking to like mm. do his own thing or her own thing? What are the key ingredients that they need to have in place? Or do they even need to have ingredients? Like, how, how do you think about it? Great question, because it's what I've been trying to figure out for the last four years. Because my mission, I think since 2017, when I actually left a very lucrative business, because it wasn't giving me the lifestyle that I was looking for. I was always, always there. 24-7 had to be there. What was it? What was that it mean? was a tuition business. So oh, yeah, you did tuition for a while. Yeah, I did yeah. a lot of stuff, bro. Yeah. I was looking, searching, searching, searching for the thing. Yeah. Um, so then we started the Golden Touch Academy, and we're trying to encourage people to get yeah. into um, entrepreneurship, get into so investing. Tuition and all that business, sort of what stuff. happened to that? Is it still going somewhere? Uh, still going, though it suffered massively in COVID. Right, yeah. Uh, I had already left like a year before that. Right, right. Um, but I just walked out, walked out, you know, walked yeah. out. Didn't take any equity back, nothing. I just yeah. walked out because it wasn't going to give me my, the end goal that I was looking right. for. Um, so I have been working in this domain for a while, helping people make that transition. So Ingredients. Hang so hang on. So the, the tuition business, you were, you were making a living. You were making it was a very good living. Yeah. Yeah. Alhamdulillah. And it's the first time, you know, yeah. those movies where yeah. finally the doors open <laughs> and the cash is coming. People are queuing outside to yeah. join your center. Yeah. Everyone's happy and butterflies. It was yeah. like that. It oh felt like that. Subhanallah. Oh Can you share how much you're making at that time? Um, it was going up every month. Right. So I think at the peak when we had close to 200 students, you're looking at probably 15 to 20K profit per month. Right, wow. For me, it was a lot of money because I wasn't yeah. making that in a year <laughs> before, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? And, and that's one branch. Imagine once you have two, three, four, five yeah, branches, there's money, uh, there's good money. And we were actually setting a new benchmark in, in the tuition space. Mm. When your child comes, he's not going to be taught by an A-level student or a uni student. Mm. It'll be a proper teacher, PGC qualified yeah, teacher yeah. and all that sort of jazz. So 15 to 20K a month and then you walk out. Yeah, I start from zero. Why? Again. Because I couldn't see my, it, it became a trap. The money is there, but I'm also working every single weekend, early oh, morning. Right. I'm working every single evening. I don't have a life. Well, well, how am I going to get married? How am I going to have kids? Working weekdays as well? Yes, because we are expanding. So we started doing classes in Monday evening, Tuesday evening, Wednesday evening, Thursday oh, evening. <laughs> and um, we didn't have the mindset at the time to, you know, delegate, outsource, everybody wanted to speak to me and my partner. All the parents want to speak to us, the teachers want to speak to us, the children mess around when we're not, when we're not there. So it was the sort of thing, hold on, I've got the banker's problem now. Yeah. Making decent money, but I don't have the time to spend it. I was trying to get married at the time, now. how am I going to meet someone or someone's family if I'm working every single weekend yeah. and every single evening? <laughs> it was, uh, so you walked out for love? Possibly for love of myself, <laughs> for love of a better life. How did how did that decision like that? Because that's a serious decision that I was don't hard. think it most people would easily make, if at all. Right? You've you've like spent a number of years struggling. Now you've like First started making ever. fifteen twenty k a month, and and then something happens. Like, what's that mental decision? To be fair. I have to give a bit more context. And this time I've met another mentor. I'm very big on mentors. Like you're also a mentor to me. I learn wow. everything you write, everything you produce. I try to learn something from it. 
so learn from people and i met a mentor who had a completely different perspective on business for him business is a mechanism that allows you to live a perfectly balanced life so heavy on leverage so you then need to be very selective on what type of business you get into how the business is structured as well and i was learning from him learning from him and then uh, one day he shared an opportunity he's like look I do investment introductions and referrals. I don't have an office, I don't, you know, I just have a network, a yeah. couple of emails, and sometimes I make 5K, sometimes I make 10K, sometimes I make 20K. I'm like, wow, you can do that? <laughs> just from an email? It just blew my mind. So um, he had an investment opportunity, it was halal. I knew loads of my friends who were trying to find halal investments. This is like 2016, yeah. um, sorry, 17. Yeah. You guys didn't have Curate yeah. just yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was a massive gap in the market, the halal investing. So I just put a Facebook message out. Anyone interested in investing in a halal thingy? It's like this percentage a month. And I got a f crazy response. And then from that event, we raised a fair amount. And from that fair amount, the, um, there was some commission. And I was like, wow, I did one event. And we made thousands of pounds in commission. Wow, that's different. <laughs> and that's when I realized that there are other ways of making income. Mm. And I thought, okay, let me see if I can build this out. Um, and the mentor was willing to support me. So it was kind of a boat was getting built while this one was drowning. Another yeah. one was being built. But it was a hard decision because there was no income here. Yeah. I had to create my own income and step away from something lucrative. I, there were days where I slept in the tuition center because it was so much work. There was no point in me going home. Mm. I just slept there. There was a nice bathroom, freshen up, eight o'clock, open the doors. To walk away from that is not easy. But again, there was something I was fighting for, something I yeah. was searching. And... Um, yeah, that, that was the start of Golden Touch Academy, which okay. then grew into educational content and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. And that was great, but uh, we have fantastic reviews in our programs. Everything's fantastic, but people really wanted something tangible. Tani, yeah. we love what you've taught us. Yeah. You've changed our mindset. We know how to manage our money now. Okay, how, tell us what, what, what business should we get into? Yeah. And that's where we used to get stuck. Mm. Like, okay, you know, What's your passion? <laughs> yeah. Let's turn that into a business. Yeah. It doesn't work like that. So when I started um, in this period, by the way, sorry, I'm going into my story a lot. This golden touch thing wasn't giving me a stable income. So yeah. I needed some way to stabilize my income. So I started researching what's a good passive income. I'm yeah. sure everyone does yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. And I came across property, yeah. a particular strategy within property. So I thought, okay, let's give this a shot. I had no money. What's the strategy called? It's, a, it's called rent to rent, right. which is essentially leasing an yeah. asset and running a business on it. Yeah. Hilton, Marriott, all the big hotel chains do the same. They don't build their own hotels. They don't buy hotels. They just lease them from mm. whoever owns it and they run their business on it. So it's a very simple, it's been, people have been doing it for donkey's years. And I learned from a lady who was doing it at a slightly higher level, meaning that she would do really nice professional mm. um, um, houses just like this one yeah um, and so uh, on this rent to rent stuff so um, uh, you know we have so many um, false kind of gurus yeah. or charlatans that abound w when it comes to like online businesses property businesses yeah. all sorts of things right how um, is it a scam property this or, like rent to rent and all of this stuff. So that's interesting because you are right. There's so many people pushing ads and all of this and that. It's a business model. Mm. The person pushing you a course, you know, the person who's got three properties mm. trying to teach you a course yeah. could be a scam. Mm. Maybe it's not a scam. It's just a bad product. Yeah. I've done a course myself with a lady who works two hours a week. Mm. Her portfolio set, team set. She just t touches base with them two hours a week. That's it. And she's flying the world, doing yoga retreats, um, uh, volunteering for UNICEF. I was like, right. that's the lifestyle that's right, we should it? have as Muslims, yeah. right? So in that moment, something happened, which is, okay, 
if she can do it, why can't I? Mm. And that was the start of, okay, I'm going to give this a shot. That was in when? That was July, sorry, June 2019, two weeks before I got married. Wow. So the timing wasn't great, <laughs> which yeah. is why I didn't have any money. Unstable income still with Unstable Golden. Unstable income still, just about stable enough because yeah. I had a few consulting gigs here and right, there, right, right. helping a few friends with, uh, with a few yeah. things. Yeah. So it was just about stable enough for me to get married. And some people know the story. I only had a thousand pounds in my account when I agreed to get married right. or agreed to start looking for someone. And that made a lot of people run a mile. Right. Um, but that was where I was. I literally had only a thousand pounds. So there's a lot of different things here. I want to make sure we stay on track. Yeah. Is I we're getting started, into Sequoia. We're getting yeah, there. Yeah, we're, we're getting, getting there. We're getting there. So essentially, I'm doing work that I love, which is teaching them, teaching Muslims, coaching them, supporting them. Um, but I was doing a bit of one-to-one -one coaching as well. Mm. From that, we had some nice, uh, interesting businesses start up, mashallah. Um, but it wasn't scalable. Mm. And it was, I'm still trading my time for money. And I needed two grand a month. Mm. So then I can focus, no, no worries about income. I'll just do the teaching and encouraging people to get into entrepreneurship and all of that good stuff we were doing. Where do I get two grand a month in recurring income? Yeah. So the research led me to this strategy. Mm. Uh, and that strategy can be used in many different ways. Um, went on a course, started implementing, didn't have any money, by the way. So that's not an excuse. Not having money is not an excuse to not start a business. Because mm. the money will come. If you are investable, yeah. and if the idea is good, and the plan looks good, the money will come. Mm. So I just approached a friend, listen, this is what I want to do. I'm willing to give you a third of the business, mm. but I need you to fund me. The first yeah. three properties, I need the capital for it. Mm. The first 5K that you give me, if the business doesn't go where we want it to, yeah. I'll owe it to you as a debt, personal debt. Yeah. So there's no risk for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'll only give, ask you for money when I need it. So this is where strategy comes in. It's thinking a bit strategically. How can I make this risk-free for someone and still achieve what I need to yeah. achieve? So that's how we started, alhamdulillah. And beginning was very, very hard. It took me like four and a half months to get my first deal. Very, very hard. Kept going, 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 going. A point came where I was running both businesses. Yeah. I also have a newborn baby. Oh my God. Uh, it's like, oof, I'm supposed to live the freedom life. What's going on? Yeah. <laughs> I'm just like, too much. Yeah. And um, like I said, I'm big on mentorship and coaching. So I had a coach, I had a mentor. He said to me, you need to either choose which one you want to do or, or bring someone in to run one of them. So obviously my passion is in the teaching and coaching. Mm. So I was like, okay, let me bring a partner in the property business. Yeah. And Qadr Allah, right person came at the right time through a Facebook message. This is complete Qadr. Alhamdulillah. And he's now running the entire business. He's the one that's managing everything. So I've completely removed myself. So we then went from 30 rooms to now 160. Wow. Hoping to get to about 400 by the end of the year. Brilliant. And keep on going. Yeah. Because the market really is crying out loud for quality properties, a quality service. Yeah. And uh, landlords are also crying out for a trustworthy company to work with. Yeah. And so what would your advice be? So like, should we talk like, like numbers? How does it work? Like, like a property like sure, this, for sure, example? Sure. Um, so it's very, it, it's, um, there's different ways of doing it. Some people will take on a house and put on Airbnb, hmm. run it as an Airbnb hotel, serviced accommodation. I didn't like that model because I'm looking for passive income. Yeah. I don't want to have to send cleaners every two days, yeah. change the laundry, linen, top up the fridge. Yeah. Is there better margins with the Airbnb? There are better margins, but it's more fragile and seasonal. Yeah. In COVID lockdown, the whole industry was shut down. Of course, yeah. Alhamdulillah, in COVID we grew. Yeah. So I, pro I decided to go with the strategy which deals with house shares. So you rent a nice big five bedroom house like this one, and you rent out rooms because there are thousands of people who can't afford or mm. want, are not willing to spend 1500 for a one bed flat. <laughs> London is such a city that you have people coming to work here from other cities in the UK as well as other cities in other countries. Yeah, yeah. 
they don't necessarily need a whole flat to themselves or a whole house. They're happy to live in a nice room. Mm. They're happy to have other people uh, that are on the same wavelength as them. So they're looking for rooms. Mm. In fact, the demand for rooms in London is probably 7x more than the supply. Wow. That's crazy. And and what are the en suites, these, these rooms? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. Not everybody is looking for an en suite. Yeah. And... Um, some people are happy to share. In most properties, we've got five, six rooms. You'll have two or three, three bathrooms. Right, interesting. So even, even in this one, there's a toilet here. There's yeah. one upstairs and there's two on suites up there as well. So, yeah. so these are called HMOs. Yeah. yeah. HMOs. And, and so how does it work then? You go to um, a land, like how do you find a property like this? And mm. you, you like look for a property that's available and be like, look, can, can I take this for a long period of time? and I'll give you the rent that you want, um, but you agree for me to then make this into a HMO. So there's a s slight complication here is that most HMOs need to be licensed. Most properties need to be licensed to run as a HMO. Oh, I see, What's right. the license is the health and safety stuff like the alarms, yeah. fire alarms, fire detectors, fire doors. Because yeah. when you have unrelated people living together, yeah. Somebody could be doing something in the room, a fire course. catches, sure. the other people need to be safe. So most, the only properties we work with are licensed. And that may sound difficult, but there's 170,000 HMOs in London. Wow. Half a million in the UK. Wow. So there's plenty of properties that are licensed. Yeah. So we don't go through the whole process of getting it licensed. And you can approach these landlords because the council has to inform publicly where these properties are and who's, got, who's the license holder. Right. So we know exactly where to find them. Yeah. And so um, what, was the, like, what were the, the hardest challenges that you faced in building this business? The, dif the most difficult part is getting started. You're a nobody. No experience in property. I didn't have zero experience in property. I never thought I'd be in property. <laughs> so yeah. I thought maybe one day I can do the homes under the hammer stuff yeah, yeah, yeah. when I'm almost retired. Um, I'm a nobody, no track record, no experience, no financials. My company was incorporated two weeks ago. Why would a landlord trust me? Yeah. That was the diff most difficult part. And that's the thing that um, I'm able to help with a lot with the mentees that I'm helping at the minute because um, they can leverage our brand mm. and that gets them started straight away. But that was the most difficult part, which is why it took me four months to convince mm. someone to give me their property. And they believed in me as a person. <clears throat> and that was the difficult part. And then after that, uh, because there's demand for rooms, of course, uh, we had some trouble in um, COVID, but we found a way to actually grow in that period. Right. And uh, yeah, I would say that is the most difficult part, starting. And uh, what does your day-to-day -day look like now? My day-to-day -day is a bit different. So I, as of, since my wife went back to work, which is in 2020, 21, I think, I've been working three and a half days a week, alhamdulillah. So she's part-time, I'm part-time, she's a nurse. Right. So she does very long shifts. Um, so I spend, Every Thursday for the last two years, I've been off with my son the whole day. From the moment he wakes up till the moment he goes to bed, I'm with him. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. So that's something that, this is what I worked so hard for, yeah. right? How old is he? He is now three and a bit. Right, right. Three and a bit. So Alhamdulillah, it's been wonderful to be able to do that. When he was born, I took nine weeks off. Um, this is why I wanted to do business in the first place. Mm. So that was important to me. So, I mean, I could work every day. I would love to work every day, bro. Honestly, I would love to work every day because I love what I do. Yeah. Honestly. But I'm restricting have you, myself. Have you always worked, loved what you do? Since, yeah, since leaving corporate, kind of, yeah. Because yeah. I would only get involved in something I believe in. Right. Yeah. The, so the money wasn't too much a thing. It's like, okay, yeah. what will we be doing? So alhamdulillah, I have worked seven days a week for a long, long time. Yeah doing multiple, multiple things. Yeah. Now that I have a family, it's important for me. And I've, mm. I have mentors who have demonstrated to me it's possible to run a successful business mm. while also be being there more than the average dad. And for me also, maybe my up upbringing, mm. my dad was always, always working. Mm. I had to work to put food on the table. 
maybe that's something that had an effect on me that, you know, I yeah. want to be an involved father. I've always liked children. I've always been good with children. Yeah. Uh, so now that I have my own, I'm like, okay, let's, uh, let's, let's do a good job of it. Yeah. And all we can do as parents is try, yeah. right? Hidayah is from Allah. Um, so we can just try. And in most cases, when you see a well-rounded child, there's always a lot of effort behind it mm. from the parents' side. There's always yeah. a lot of effort. Fair parents, also wider family. So I work three and a half days a week. So Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, I'm pretty full on. Start very early, finish relatively late. Thursdays I'm off, Fridays I'm off, and weekend is usually for family. Yeah. May do the occasional bit of work here. Maybe there's yeah. a viewing, there's a meeting, there's a podcast episode or whatever. Yeah. So there's a bit of that. So Alhamdulillah, that's been going for two years now. Alhamdulillah. Brilliant. And what does um, the future hold? What excites you about the future? What I'm really excited about is, alhamdulillah, obviously our business is growing, uh, but I actually spend most of my time mentoring and teaching people how to replicate what we're doing in different parts of the country. And that's going really, really well, mashallah. So I'm ex excited to see where we can take that. I'm excited about potentially expanding um, and you know, bringing everybody under one roof, maybe, to build a mega, <laughs> mega business. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, also starting a few other ventures on the side. I'm a big believer in giving people an opportunity. Um, so if I have an idea and I know it's going to work and I can think of the clients and I know exactly how I would pitch it, I go out there and try and find someone who could hmm. lead on that venture. Yeah. So there's two examples of that already that Hamdir has worked out very well, changed their life because they went from one brother in particular. Um, he was applying for grad schemes, 20K, 30K, 35K. He makes that in a month now. Subhanallah. Wow. <laughs> so it's like it's life changing stuff. And it's great for me, too. Right. It's all that That's crazy. Uh, so, yeah, I think it's a very exciting. I'm very excited. Uh, what was that business? Now. What is that business? It's a marketing consultancy. Right, right, right. So we run the entire marketing and sales for anyone who has something to teach. Right, right, right. So they can just focus on teaching. We'll do everything else. And we take a commission. It's a revenue share model. Right, right, right. Alhamdulillah. So Tanim, you know, you're obviously, you know, a practicing Muslim and mm -hmm. you care about your religion and that being an important part of your life. How does that interact with you, you know, as a businessman? I think that's actually a superpower that's been helping me so much. There's actually certain things that we have as Muslims, which I don't know how people function without. So for example, if you're thinking of starting something, and you know that you have a provider who has already decided what's going to come your way. He completely de-risks the, the, the decision. Consciously, you may be scared, but if your risk is fixed, what have I got to lose? Mm. It, will, it will find its way somehow. Yeah. And I've seen this with my own eyes, like risk will come from things. Once I, um, I needed exactly 283 pounds for something and a letter came it was a refund from the student finance uh, department it was a check for 290 pounds wow subhanallah so when you actually experience that and you experience these things more when you're in business mm. so firstly being in business can make you a more spiritual person which benefits you ultimately but let's talk about how being a muslim helps you in business so firstly the fact that you know that my provision, whether I work here or here or here, my provision will come. I won't yeah. die until every penny or yeah. every grain of rice has come my way. Yeah. That should make us unstoppable. Mm. Secondly, there's a lot of uncertainty in business. Mm. A lot of things gone, don't go the way you might want to. Some deals don't go through, come through. We have the belief that whatever happens is for the best. Right? Allah's plan is always a benevolent one for us. Mm. We may not understand it now. Like when I failed two years at uni, what do you think was going through my mind? Mm. Like, why is this happening to me? I worked so hard. Why? Looking back, that was the best thing that could have happened. Because mm. by the way, in two, those two years, not only did I learn resilience, I also dabbled in like 
five or six different businesses. Wow. And that what's what gave me even more confidence. Yeah. So subhanAllah, yeah. when you look back, mm. Allah always makes the right decisions mm. for us. We may not understand it. We probably won't understand it because we are very yeah. limited. So having that belief, that tawakkul, that whatever happens, whether this deal comes through or not, I know it's for the best. Yeah, yeah. The whole point of istikhara is to leave the decision in Allah's hand, meaning mm. Allah, if it's good for me, facilitate it for me. Mm. Bring it closer and facilitate it. If it's not good for me, for my life, my akhirah, remove it from me and mm. remove me from it. Mm. So you can operate with no yeah. anxiety, no yeah. worries, full trust. Yeah. So we should be unstoppable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The values that we carry as Muslims, your word is your bond. Honesty, every penny, we're, you know, every landlord that we work with, to the penny, we're accurate with everything. We don't overcharge, we don't hide any, and everything's completely transparent. Mm. That helps, because that builds trust, and trust gives you more business. Yeah. So I find it strange that as Muslims, we're not at the very top of the business game. I find yeah. it very strange. Yeah. But again, so then I need to show, show that it can be done, right? So yeah. that's kind of what I'm trying to do is, okay, let's show. And I think, alhamdulillah, you guys are doing fantastic, is let's show what we can do as Muslims, that we have something to offer, we can make this world a better place. And we're doing this because of our faith and through our faith. Yeah. And um, then what would your advice be as, uh, as we come to a close for, um, you know, budding entrepreneurs or people who are in, a, in the corporate life looking to leave, you know, what's the, you know, the top, two advices you would give them? If somebody is in full-time work, which alhamdulillah is a blessing to have mm -hmm. an income, yeah, don't, you know, don't, don't forget to be grateful yeah. for being in that position. That's good. If you're looking for the best, which is to be financially independent and all that good stuff, first and foremost, uh, you need to educate yourself. Mm. Educate yourself about business, about the mindsets that you need to have learn from entrepreneurs, watch all the podcast episodes, yeah. um, educate yourself, number one. And number two, pick your vehicle very carefully. Don't just jump into something because it sounds lucrative. Mm. Will this car still run 15 years from now? Mm. Will this car be enough to carry me and my family? Mm. Will this car be a bumpy ride or a smooth ride? Is it a fast one, is it a slow one? Pick the vehicle very, very carefully. Yeah. And the bonus third tip, find someone who's got the business, the life, the impact that you want to have yeah. and just stalk the hell out of them. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I did for a long time. I would just, how can I help you for free? Yeah. I'll do anything. Yeah. And that allows you to spend time with them. And if you spend time with them, you have an opportunity to gain, yeah. absorb, yeah. osmosis. Yeah. And you may get that chance to ask them that important question that yeah. is going to change your life. Mm. So those are the three bits that I would recommend. And of course, follow the good content that is being put out by people who are trying to help you. No, Jazakallah khair for your time, Tanim. Where can people find you? So I am most active on LinkedIn. I am going to be more active on YouTube and TikTok as well. Fantastic. So Tanim Zaman at any, any, any of those uh, platforms. I'm going to be, inshallah, producing more and more content around entrepreneurship Brilliant. And, and this sort of thing, inshallah. Amazing. Well, Tanim, look, it's, it's an absolute pleasure. And uh, um, I, I, for one, have learned a lot in this conversation, but also ongoing as well. Um, you know, it's been my pleasure because uh, I've... Um, I don't know if you remember, we had coffee 2019. You were still working full time. I remember. And I was sitting there trying to convince him, bro, when are you going to do this full time, yeah. bro? Come on, your partners. You're like, bro, we have a plan. <laughs> and the moment you quit is been yeah. madness. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. So pleased to see that. Yeah. It's like incredible, mashallah. May Allah continue to give you yeah. tawfiq and keep amplifying the work that you're doing. Mashallah. Ameen. Jazakallah khair, Tanim. And... Uh, Inshallah, we'll, we'll check in in uh, two, three years' time. Hopefully sooner. your next project. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully sooner, Inshallah. Inshallah, Inshallah. Thank you so much. Barakallah right. Fikram. Right. Salaam alaikum.